Hello students and welcome to Nursing 3370 Module 2 Overview. This lecture will provide you a brief overview of the three lessons learned in Module 2. This review will serve as your exam study guide. First, let's review fluids. Remember there are two fluid compartments, the intracellular fluids and the extracellular fluids. So really it's fluids inside or outside the cells. Intracellular fluids is the largest. It holds the largest percent of human body weight. Fluid is balanced with thirst, with the antidiuretic hormone, and with aldosterone. Fluid is moved through the body by hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure. When the osmotic pressure of the blood is elevated above normal, water would shift from the interstitial compartment into the blood. There are three different types of fluids. First, hypotonic fluids. These types of fluids lead to shifting a fluid from extracellular to intracellular space. Isotonic fluids have the same osmolality as plasma, which means there's no shifting of fluid that will occur and the fluid will stay in the intravascular space. Hypertonic fluids cause cell dehydration. They cause the cell to become dehydrated and help increase fluid in the extracellular or intravascular space. It's important to know these three different types of fluids. Fluid imbalances often occur. When we have too much fluid, we have a fluid excess. A primary cause of fluid excess would be uh, edema, increased capillary hydrostatic pressure. This presents as swelling, increased weight, pain in the patient, and impaired circulation. You can see the foot here with normal, what it looks like with no swelling or edema, and then the lower foot here, which has the edema or the swelling or the too much fluid. A fluid deficit is too little fluid. Primary causes of too little fluid include dehydration, which happens when there's vomiting, diarrhea, diabetes, ketoacidosis, or not drinking enough water. It also can be caused from insensible fluid loss. And remember, if you recall, insensible fluid loss means losing fluid through perspiration and sweating. Compensation mechanisms for dehydration or things your body does to try and improve the dehydration include thirst, increasing the heart rate, peripheral vascular vasoconstriction, an increased antidiuretic hormone, which in turn will help slow urinary output. When patients are losing fluids, they may also lose electrolytes and proteins. Your, your vulnerable populations for dehydration include the very young and the very old. We talked about when losing fluids, you can also lose electrolytes. Sodium levels can either be high or low. Hyponatremia would be low sodium. Hypernatremia would be high sodium. Hyponatremia or low sodium is often caused by sweating, vomiting, or diarrhea. It can also be caused by excessive water intake. Hypernatremia or too much sodium, remember water follows salt. Sodium imbalances causes fluid shifts. Another electrolyte imbalance might be potassium or kalemia. Hypokalemia would be low potassium. Hyperkalemia would be high potassium. Hypokalemia or too low potassium presents as a weakness, muscle twitching, cardiac arrhythmias. It can be caused from potassium losses from diarrhea or diuresis. Remember that potassium controls nervous and muscle function as well as your heart is a muscle. So remember your potassium controls all these things. It's important to know what happens when you have too little potassium or too much potassium. Cardiac arrhythmias are gonna be really important to watch with potassium. I'm gonna pause here and talk a little bit about acid base. I know this section is very overwhelming and confusing. It does take a while to kind of master acid base balance and even professionals have to stop and look up um, what the differences are, what the lows and what the highs are. Your big takeaways is that the goal is to know what the normal numbers are and what the numbers look like when they're not normal. 
So remember, a normal pH range is 7.35 to 7.45. A low pH would be acidosis. A high pH is alkalosis. It's also important to know the compensation mechanisms, or also known as the acid-base control. Like, what happens to your body when these become abnormal? Compensation mechanisms Compensation mechanisms that maintain normal serum pH levels include buffer pairs in the circulating blood system, changes in respiratory rates, and renal acid elimination or base excretion. Understanding common causes is also really important, like metabolic acidosis is often caused by excessive diarrhea, whereas respiratory alkalosis can be caused by conditions that lead to breathing excessively fast such as anxiety or panic attacks. Reviewing the screens on what is your common causes, those would, will be helpful. But again, just know your normal numbers. Know what your normal pH is, know what your normal CO2 is, and know what your normal HCO3 is. Interpreting the blood gases is important. This is a, this is a table that you'll wanna memorize. You'll wanna know your normal pHs, your normal PCO2s, and your normal HCO3s. Know those normal ranges so that when you were given a list of pHs, PCO2s, and HCO3s, you will know if they're high, low, or normal. The ROM becomes important is a way to memorize when it's respiratory, it'll be in the opposite direction. So look at your screen here. See where it's respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. See how it's opposite. When one is low, the other is high. Versus metabolic is equal. Look at your metabolic acidosis and your metabolic alkalosis. Your pH and your HCO3 are equal. They're both either low or they're both either high. This is a table that I'd want to write down if I were you and just really start memorizing your highs and your lows. Talking about alterations in the pulmonary system, it's important to remember that ventilation is a movement of air based on the pressure gradient. During normal ventilation, airway always moves from the area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Your control of ventilation will be primary or secondary. And just real quickly, gas exchanges is what we're really gonna talk about when we learn about the different um, respiratory conditions, how the, how the gas flows um, is really gonna be important for your various different um, pulmonary conditions. And the first one we'll talk about is pneumonia. Pneumonia can lead to hypoxia that sometimes becomes very severe with a patient. Patients with pneumonia are often congested. This congestion in the lungs prevents oxygen diffusion. Patients with pneumonia often present with high fevers, chills, dyspnea or difficulty breathing, and a very productive cough. When listening to a patient's lungs with pneumonia, we often hear crackles. There are several different causes of pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia would be specific to a bacterial infection. If they have a bacterial infection, antibiotics are often given. Cystic fibrosis, on the other hand, is excessive mucus that plugs everything. It commonly affects the lungs, and by association, it also affects, affects the pancreas, but we're learning about this today under the respiratory system. Cystic fibrosis causes thick mucus, mucus which obstructs airflow in the bronchioli. This can cause permanent damage to the bronchial walls. Infections with these patients are very, very common. Signs and symptoms would include like a salty skin, a look of malabsorption, a very chronic cough, delayed growth. It's very lifelong and a li life-limiting condition. I actually know a patient, um, personal family friend that had cystic fibrosis and the treatment was uh, they actually had a double lung transplant. Uh, it's still a lifelong condition. Um, excessive mucus um, can still occur. And that's probably one of the big takeaways is that thick mu mucus in these conditions obstructs the airflow in the bronchioli. Asthma, on the other hand, which I'm sure most people have heard of asthma, the physiology behind asthma is inflammation of the bronchi, bronchioles, which causes edema in the lungs. It causes bronchoconstriction and, of course, increased secretion of the thick mucus. The pathological occur uh, changes that occur in asthma, I, I just said, it's increased secretion of thick mucus, inflammation of the mucosa with edema, and bronchoconstriction that is due to contraction of the smooth muscle. Extrinsic asthma is caused by an external exposure that leads to an asthma attack. The patient has a hypersensitivity to something and it has a reaction that then causes chemical mediators. Signs and symptoms of asthma include coughing, 
wheezing, shortness of breath, fast heart rate, hypoxia, and then of course your acid base balance changes, which you really don't have to memorize here for asthma. Just go back to memorizing your numbers and know that the symptoms of asthma are coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. A status asthmaticus is a medical emergency, um, but most often you'll see a patient presenting with a wheezing, the cough, and the shortness of breath. COPD gets pretty complicated, I understand that, and we'll break down just a few different conditions that are associated with COPD, and the first one, of course, be emphysema. It's really important to remember that emphysema is the destruction of the alveoli, so emphysema is the destruction that occurs all the way down in those alveolar walls. The symptoms include uh, the purse-slip breathing, shortness of breath, tachypnea, like fast breathing, with a really prolonged expiratory, expiratory phase. These are the, the pink puffers. They have the um, barrel chest, exertional dyspnea, the, again, that prolonged expiratory time where it just takes a longer for them to blow out their breath. It's really important to remember that hypoxia becomes the driving force for respirations in a person with emphysema. Chronic bronchitis, which is another component of the COPD. Chronic bronchitis is caused by chronic inflammation, chronic irritation, and recurrent infections of the larger airways. Whereas remember the emphysema was those alveoli, chronic bronchitis, is those largest bronchioles, those larger airways. Signs include low oxygen levels, which is also known as hypoxia, a productive thick secretion, shortness of breath, and orthopnea. And remember, orthopnea means difficulty breathing when laying down. The chron chronic bronchitis patients are those blue bloaters. They have the exer exertional dyspnea. You can see here the picture of what he looks like, use of accessory muscles, and again, your, your, your symptoms really include those low oxygen levels, thick cough, uh, secretions, shortness of breath, and the orthopnea. When we look at the pharmacology of respiratory conditions, it's important to remember the SABAs and the LABAs, the short-acting beta antagonist and the long-acting beta antagonist. Both medications are bronchodilators, which work by widening the airways because they stimulate the fight or flight response of the nervous system. SABAs, or short-acting, would be used in the acute episodes of shortness of breath and wheezing because they provide the fastest relief. So think back to that asthma patient who prevents with shortness of breath and wheezing. You're going to give them a short-acting or SABA bronchodilator because they work fast to provide the most relief for shortness of breath and wheezing. Both SABAs and LABAs medications can increase the patient's heart rate. It's important to tell the patient that that might be a side effect that could happen. Inhaled corticosteroids or ICS inhalers are used for more long-term treatment of asthma and COPD because they suppress airway inflammation and they reduce airway hyperresponsiveness. And then finally, the LAMAs, the long-acting muscaric anti-antagonists, block the parasympathetic nervous system to try to dry up secretions, which then in turn, if the secretions are dried up, in turn cause a bronchodilator effect. Okay, changing gears into neural, anatomical, anatomical features of the brain include meninges, the blood-brain barrier, and cerebral spinal fluid. When looking at this anatomy further, it's important to recognize the blood-brain barrier controls the balance of electrolytes, glucose, and proteins by limiting the passage of materials at the capillary level of the brain. Increased intracranial pressure, a very early sign of this, includes decreased level of consciousness, whereas a late sign is that Cushing's triad. An early sign of increased intracranial pr process, pressure excuse me, is the decreased LOC, a very late sign is that Cushing triad, which is a, a increased pulse pressure, decreased heart rate, and decreased respiratory rate. So really important, know the difference between your early signs and your late signs. As we look further into neural conditions and we talk about vascular conditions, TIA, transic, trans, transient ischemic attack, it's only temporary ischemia. It's often called a mini stroke. 
Signs and symptoms really depend on the location of the ischemia. Repeat attacks may be a future indicator of a CVA. So oftentimes TIAs are thought of a warning sign that a future cerebral vascular accident may occur. Acute neuro conditions continued on, va uh, vascular conditions, the CVA, cere cerebrovascular accident, also known as a stroke. It's an infarct to the brain that is caused by a lack of blood flow. The degree of collateral circulation is the factor that determines the extent of the cerebral damage. And there's two different types of stroke. Ischemic is more common and it's caused by a blot, cl blood clot. Whereas hemorrhagic is less common, but it's also very much uh, more, it's, it's dangerous. It's less common, but it's more deadly. It does have usually a very poor prognosis. Risk factors for CVA stroke include hypertension, smoking, coronary artery disease, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle. Signs and symptoms really depend on the location of the obstruction, the size of the artery, and the area affected. Seizures are abnormal or uncontrolled neurological, uh, neuronal discharges in the brain. Common causes are infection, metabolic disorders, medications, or trauma. The most common seizure in children is a febrile seizure. The postictal state is when the seizure is over. The patient often presents like they are in a very deep sleep. Medications that we use, um, it's really important to remember in seizures, the medications the goal of the anti-epileptic or seizure medications is to prevent and suppress the neuronal activity to prevent abnormal firing. Medications given for epilepsy must be continued indefinitely. Patients can't just stop these medications. They need to take them indefinitely. Of course, they're going to work with their healthcare providers, but you as nurses, it's really important to remember that they, they must continue this medication indefinitely. Parkinson's disease um, is the most common degenerative central nervous system disease. Signs and symptoms include tremors, bradykinesia, and muscle rigidity. Treatment causes, um, the treatments often cause actually more side effects. It's important that we treat Parkinson's, but it's also important to know that treatment can also cause some major adverse reactions known as extrapyramidal symptoms. The goal of the medications with Parkinson's is to help increase the level of dopamine. Levodopa crosses the blood-brain barrier. And finally, the last neural condition is Alzheimer's disease. It's the second most common degenerative um, central nervous disease. It's unknown cause. Um, chronic inflammation and oxidative cell damage is how it's usually presented. Structural uh, changes in the brain from lack of acetylcholine. It progressively damages to the neurons. Signs and symptoms include your progressive memory loss, impaired judgment, psychosis. There's really no cure. Uh, the medication, the goal of the medication that it might only help symptoms for a little while, it's going to help slow and progress. It might help improve their activities of daily life. It might improve their behavior, um, but it only usually helps for a little while, uh, the different type of medications that we give. So exam two, I'm going to go back to these screens here real quick um, and just review some, some important parts. The exam is 50 questions, multiple choice select all that apply. Hotspot, meaning there's one question where you have to point to something certain and is uh, specific and show um, a level of uh, where the lung damage is. And that'll be just one question where you click on it. And then there's a few true and false questions. So to study and prepare, again, just like the last exam, it's to review the lecture materials, only the recorded lectures. So there's three recorded lectures, the respiratory acid-base balance, the fluid, the neural, review those lectures, and then again, review this um, exam prep. If we scroll back up, there's only about 20 slides here. And these slides are do provide you your study overview for this exam. If you kind of go through each slide, have a basic understanding of what's on the screen and a basic understanding of um, the, the things I, I say out loud and kind of take notes on that, I think you'll do just fine on the exam. Please let me know if you have any questions and concerns. I know this is a lot of material and I know this, this recorded lecture was very quick, but that was the point is to highlight your big takeaways from these uh, three lessons that were in module two. Let me know if you have any questions and concerns. I look forward to hearing from you.